Lord, tonight's going to be an adventure, trying something a little different. And may it be something that you want to happen, and may your word be heard, not mine. And may we grow together in learning more about you and your kingdom. And Lord, we lift up Sam, who's been struggling for a while now, and he wants very much to be here. He's one of our more active friends, but he's not able to do that right now. And Lord, we ask for healing for him, that there is no need for further surgery, which is one of the concerns, fears right now, and that you will heal him and bring him back to the body so we can enjoy his company. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. Keep the enemy far from this place as we fellowship and learn about you. And then we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was being super spiritual before you guys came in and was picking on him for the words in the song, I won't have to worry anymore. Well, you don't have to worry now. And, and God sort of reminded me, You've been worried all day about all kinds of different things. <laughs> this has been a fairly rough day with, from a lot of different directions. But uh, we're putting all that behind us and going to study tonight. But before studying, I want my class to all close their Bibles and pull out a piece of paper and a pencil. We're going to have a pop quiz on Hebrew history and geography. I see everybody trying to do that. Okay, you win. <laughs> you guys didn't know I taught middle school before I was here, did you? All right. And that was right before I came to this position. I'm really impressed how many of you did that. I really didn't expect anything but stunned looks. And I could tell from you know, the reaction of being back in school. I wasn't really entirely kidding about the pop quiz, but it's gonna be oral. If you did get paper and pencil, thanks for your response and obedience, which is gonna be a topic again tonight. And God saw that and you will be rewarded. So your reward will be great. And if you wanna write them down, that's great, but we're gonna do them and I'll, you know, if you have an answer, you can wave at me or blurt it out. I'm not real particular. I handled the kids that nobody else, no other teachers could, so I'm used to jumping around, cussing, all that in class. So, you know, if you want to, you want to blurt it out. Those two, hopefully they're not cussing, but they definitely open their mouths whenever they want to. Okay, whose sons made up the tribes of Israel? Jacob, what's his other name? And what's happening with this fun thing? It's freaking out. So this could be why it's, it's called the tribe of Israel. But jumping up there too. I got no clue what's doing that, but we'll worry about it when we get there. Unless it's distracting. What does Israel mean? Question two. Very good. Wrestles with God. Do you think the state of Israel did that as well as the individual Jacob? Occasionally. And we'll be seeing some of that. We'll be touching on it briefly tonight. We'll be seeing lots more of that as we go through. Question three. Which tribe did not get any land and why? <laughs> You get the biggest blessing of all. Thank you. Right after you left, I told everybody that I wasn't going to make them do it with pencil and paper. But it is Levi. Why? They're the priests. They did not get land. They did get cities. But I haven't really figured out what that means yet. So we're not going to dive into that anymore. Okay. How did they determine which tribes got which land? By lots. Casting lots is what it's usually called. Now, well, we, and we think of that casting lots as rolling dice, and that's a possibility. It is mentioned, casting lots is mentioned 
70 times in the Hebrew Scriptures, only seven in the New Testament. Uh, we don't absolutely know what it means, but some of these we've done. It could be drawing sticks, you know, the shortest straw type of situation. It could be throwing something that was very similar to dice, which was available somewhere way back then, and when exactly that happened isn't certain. Uh, it could have been the equivalent of tossing a coin or a flat rock that was marked somehow. We're not real sure, and you could get lots of folks to speculate on that all day long, but we're not gonna do that. One thing I wanted to point out, while casting lots was frequently used in a godly manner in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, it's never actually a good thing. We're relying on the Holy Spirit that's with us. What is going on? It's going to drive me crazy if it doesn't drive you crazy. That's there. Okay. Very interesting. Well, that'll be fun. make it more fun later. And finally, and maybe the toughest question. Why were there still 12 parcels of land if the Levites didn't get any? I think I heard the right name, the right, one of the right names there. Uh, not Benjamin. Yeah. Joseph had a double portion, two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And that's, we're going to talk about Ephraim tonight. So, very good. And next week we'll have a retest. One of the things about it that a teacher, or this teacher did, is I always made my test divisible by five, so the math on grading was easy. So if mentally you got them all right, you got an A+. Plus. Great job. If you missed one, C. Sorry. If you missed more than one, well... The remake will be next week, so. But somebody was, as a group, you got them all, though. So I was really not expecting that. All right, Joseph's tribe was split into two half-tribes, and they're often referred to as half-tribes. And that was Manasseh and Ephraim, which you'll usually hear called Ephraim, or Ephraim, or something more English, but... The closer Hebrew would be Ephraim. In fact, any time except right now, you see I am on the end, you say Im, and it usually means it's plural. But, and I'm not, I didn't look up the name, I should have, to see if that's the case. But you do see it sometimes when it's not indicating a plural. Joseph's two sons were apparently very blessed. That became a much larger tribe, Joseph's, and they did split them into two. All righty, we've gone over our grading. I love geography, but I don't like things bouncing around, so we're going to see if we can. There's a good thought. Let's Well, I, I'm actually touching them there, but let me do something here. I wonder if maybe, aha. Well, it did seem to be somewhat fixed by engaging that a little better, but not 100%. Okay, now well, we can with it some, and I do believe that's my first one. All right, tribes of Israel, or Israel. I also try to say that right or closer, but Carolyn was listening today to a Hebrew rabbi teaching, and it was amazing how many things, oh, that's not, Heshka, that's Hezekiah. I mean, he was saying so many things that were so drastically different than what we're used to in English. And 
That is one of my goals in life is to get a little better at that. All right, we're going to try this one more time. I didn't lose this by wiggling that one, did I? All right. I will just deal with the bouncing. I do love geography, even when it's moving. And I did enjoy this chapter. If you don't like geography, well, I'm very impressed that you're still here because you've kind of been doing that since chapter 13. I don't know what other folks found to spiritualize, but there wasn't a lot in this chapter. Next week will be a little bit better, but this week I wanted to look at Israel. And the good news is, if you don't particularly like geography, you're halfway through now. There's only three more chapters after this one that we're going to be parceling out the land. But the halfway point is here, and we are going to look at the land. Okay, the last little bit of background I want to tell you before we read the text is we're going to be looking at a number of maps tonight. And this is based on chapter 16. So we'll primarily be reading, we'll be totally reading about Ephraim, who is one of Joseph, it's one of Joseph's younger sons. I did not actually find how much younger. I think after the first one, it doesn't really matter much for the rest of the sons in Judaism. They're all treated the same. But the first one is special. And the, uh, the tribe of Ephraim was one of the larger ones. And when the split between, when the split of Israel occurred later with Judah and Israel, uh, sadly, Ephraim was the most in, influential of the northern tribes. And they actually provided the first king, northern king, who was Jeroboam. And is there anything people know about all of the kings of Israel, the northern kingdom? Yeah, there's not a single one that's, it says in the Bible, was a good king. And Jeroboam started that a rolling. And Ahav, which we call Ahab, was considered the most evil king, probably because the Bible says that. But he was also from the tribe of Ephraim. So this tribe got a pretty decent chunk of land, not as much as Manasseh next week, but they also got some good land and they didn't do very well with it. The Northern Kingdom as a whole will often be referred to as Ephraim, which is a further illustration of the influence and importance of these descendants of Joseph. So we're gonna look at Ephraim and Manasseh to some extent, and we're gonna look at the rest of them as well. I do have a thought on this, but I don't know how fast it will move over if I copy it. I'm running it off of my flash drive. But uh, anyway, let me see if I can multitask and I probably can't. So, yeah, it just seems to be there, so. I almost never use this computer, so you also have to bear with me doing that, but. God bless you. Oh, well. Putting it, putting it there didn't seem to matter. I would, I would do what one of our teachers did and have somebody else read it for me, and I may still, but you have to talk real loud because you can't hear it on the recording. <laughs> but we're going to read all of chapter 16. And I'll go ahead and start that and play with that in a bit. All right, starting with verse 1. The lot fell to the children of Joseph from the Jordan by Jericho, to the waters of Jericho on the east, to the wilderness that goes up from Jericho through the mountains to Bethel. Then went out from Bethel to Lutz, passed along to the border of the Archites at Adaroth, 
and went down westward to the boundary of the Jephelotites, as far as the boundary of lower Beit Horan to Gezer. And it ended at the sea. So the children of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, took their inheritance. The border of the children of Ephraim, according to their families, was thus. The border of their inheritance on the east side was Ataroth Adar, as far as upper Beit Horan. And the border went out toward the sea on the north side of Mikmethoth. Then the border went around eastward to Ta'anoth Shiloh, and passed by it on the east of Janoha. Then it went down from Janoha to Ataroth and Naara, reached to Jericho, and came out at the Jordan. The border went out from Tapua westward to the brook Cana, and it ended at the sea. This was the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Ephraim according to their families. The separate cities for the children of Ephraim were among the inheritance of the children of Manasseh, all the cities with their villages. And they did not drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwell among the Ephraimites to this day and have become forced laborers. All right, now, not what I was trying to do, but boop. Okay, I'll hold my mouth right, this might work. Thank you for your prayers. All right. Looking at the maps. <laughs> I hope you got a good quick look there. Who among you guys has been to Israel? Okay. We got half of us. That's wonderful. And you might be able to help me out with some of the geography here. All right. I want you want to see where the tribes are. I was going to try to do that with, well, that was interesting. <laughs> All right. I think I'll point from down here because I was going to try to do it with the mouse when everything was working. All right. The children, sons of Israel, were Reuben, who we can see over here. This is the, the Dead Sea, and they, that tribe would now be in Jordan. It's no longer part of Israel. Thank you, stay that way. Good. After, after uh, Reuben was Simeon. And Simeon, on this map, down here at the bottom, we're later going to see it looking like it's right in the middle of the area of Judah. And as I said, one of the things that you'll notice in these maps, they're all a little different. Some of them are drastically different. After Simeon is Levi, and we have, I had all these earlier, but with the jumping, it's a little harder to see. Levi, there was where on the map? Gotcha. Remember our test earlier? They don't have it. <laughs> but he, he was the third son. And then we have Judah. I am trying to mess with you tonight. I hope you don't mind. Judah's bouncing around here to the west of the Dead Sea. And it surrounds Simeon on most of the maps that we're going to see tonight. And then we have Issachar, and Issachar is on the Mediterranean, and that shouldn't be too far, gosh, well that probably is a bit north of Caesarea Maritima, which is on the ocean there. Uh, Zebulun is next. And Zebulun, I seem to remember being right next to it. Yeah, it's, it's actually probably, and I can't see it on this one, but probably where Nazareth would probably land close to that area. And there's some debate about where 
Nazareth, that we've got a couple of Nazareths, and that one is sometimes considered the one where he was born, but more often we're thinking of the one, more often you're going to hear it's the one down here, that is in the Western Bank, which, yeah. <laughs> This brings it. it. Well, that took early. Did you just Stopped save it. this onto your laptop? I, I did. So you can take that out? Probably. That might make this Oh, uh, let's do it the right way. Boop. All right, I can't. That looks like the eject. Eject transmitter. It's currently in use. You think so? All right. Well, can we? Might be able to go with that briefly. It is behaving at the moment. I'm, I'm now afraid of it, but maybe that did assist. All righty. I was playing with these guys. And I'm going to pick it up a little. Naftali, God, and Asher. Again, we've got folks that are east of the Jordan that lost all of theirs their area, and Benjamin is actually over here at Jerusalem. There's an arrow there on this one, because I guess they couldn't print it there big enough. Asher is the far north and west, and then we get to Joseph, which is Manasseh, and notice you got a east Manasseh and a west of the Jordan Manasseh, and this is one that you will see a lot of different sizes, shapes, and spots as we go through the different maps. Ephraim is the other, and right in this map, it's neither touching the Jordan or what this calls the Great Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, which the way I read that, it should be touching both. And one of the things I can point out on this one that I was thinking, many of the, this doesn't have it going, but I suspect that these two rivers coming out, Ephraim probably got that little piece. I didn't see that on any of the maps. That's just me trying to make it make sense by geographical. I mean, when you set up borders, you set it up along usually ge geographical lines, streams, You'll notice that, the, well, obviously the lakes have to be a break, but the Jordan River is a break between them. And often that is how things are set up, but these maps don't necessarily follow along those. All right, after Manasseh and Ephraim, we have Benjamin, who is a tiny little spot down here, but it's got Jerusalem, so he wins. All righty. The, there are a lot of locations that you've heard of, and I'm almost tempted, but I'm not going to do it to use my mouse to point. But we have Jerusalem, Jericho here. Jerusalem is actually this one. Uh, the Ephraim has Beit El, which we've, and Shiloh, which we, and Beit El, I think, is actually part of uh, Benjamin, but Shiloh is probably the one we have heard of there. And those are a few of the spots I was going to point out more, but we're not going to spend that much more time there. Um, Modern day, Lebanon would be up where, and that is probably pretty close to the border with Lebanon at the top, at the north end of Asher and Naphtali. And then Aram over here would be Syria. And it comes down pretty much to the, dead, the north part of the Dead Sea. And today it is at 
the Dead Sea. And then below that, you have Jordan. So, but Syria is much bigger now than it was at this time, although it was even bigger before, but Aram is, is the equivalent of Assyria at that point. And it did extend to the south end of Lake Kinneret. Anybody see Lake Kinneret up there? No? Hmm. Where is that? How about the Sea of Tiberias? Okay. <laughs> All right, you caught me. You'll also hear Kinnereth and a few other variations on that one. All of those are references to the Sea of Galilee. So if you hear any of those in the future, don't let them confuse you. Uh, and like the Sea of Tiberias, Tiberias being the longest running decent sized town on there. <laughs> Yay. All right, but we usually refer to it as the Sea of Galilee. And that's what I'll do from now on. <laughs> Been there. And it is a really great place. But we're going to do that at the end, talk about how wonderful Israel is. All right. Moving. I'm scared, but let's see what we get for map four. Now here's one that, you know, everybody knows that the oldest brother gets two-thirds of the inheritance, and they do the best. And that would be uh, Reuben, and he made out all right, although he lost it because he was on the wrong side of the Jordan. But Simeon, I feel bad for. He's the second son, but he got basically desert, and he's in the middle of Judah's territory. The... I mean, we call it desert. You'll hear it referred to in the Bible as the wilderness. Well, there's a lot of wilderness, but pretty much anything west of the Dead Sea until you get close to Jerusalem will qualify as wilderness then and now. And a lot of the other areas are pretty barren, but Israel today is a green spot in a pretty barren part of the world. But you'll hear it referred to as the Negev, and that's pretty much everything south of what we're seeing. And that is about the only territory that Israel has picked up on from what we have here. Okay, it did, you know, the, like I said, the desert, the Negev is not very exciting. But these two maps are fairly similar, but we're gonna see a few others that have bigger differences that I find interesting. And what struck me is that often the borders don't follow natural boundaries, which to me is sort of not the way things are supposed to be, but they often do point out cities. And I have a feeling that they probably were more natural boundaries, but the cities were defining the area. All righty. Now, while we're looking at them, particularly take note of Ephraim. Again, this map does not make it to the Mediterranean or to the Jordan River. Sometimes it reaches one or the other, sometimes both, but they're very inconsistent in that. All righty. P5. Oops. All righty. This map actually shows Ephraim a lot harder to see, but it's both on the Jordan and actually goes well down towards the Dead Sea, and it's got a big chunk of the Mediterranean. So this particular map drawer was much nicer to Ephraim than the previous ones. Yeah, we're gonna to get to that too. <laughs> yeah, PD likes to scratch out Palestine anytime you see it, and it's actually an insult that was thrown at the Israelites, or the Israelis, well, it's well after Israelites, but we're not gonna to go too deeply into that. 
And you will see it on about half of these. But we want to look at Ephraim. And in this one, it does get a good chunk of sea and the river. This is also my favorite because it's got gobs and gobs of information. It's just too tiny to see. But it does show some of the geography, if you can tell. This, this is the Jordan River going up here, but the river is not that big. If you see a lot of stuff there, you're in a, what's called a rift valley. It is basically where tectonic plates have separated and you got a drop off and it's a very deep, in fact, I'm pretty sure, I won't bet my life on it, but the lowest point in the world is in the Dead Sea. Anybody want to argue with me knows better? <laughs> I, I believe that's correct. If it isn't the lowest, it's number two, but, but I believe it is the lowest spot on Earth as far as... And, the, is, and you'll hear this if you get to go with Edo, which I suggest, but the jets in the Israeli Air Force have to be specially equipped with altimeters that will allow it to re read below sea level because they will frequently fl be flying below sea level. So that's no extra charge for that little bit. All righty. And this is the first map we'll see that does show Ephraim on both the Mediterranean and the Jordan. Now, I was... 90% certain, but yeah. Yeah. It, is, it is another interest. Another interesting thing is, you go to the Dead Sea. It's hot and it's dry and it's sunny because it doesn't rain much there. Obviously, you got water evaporating, but you're not going to get a sunburn because of that extra atmosphere that the sun has to go through, you're reasonably well protected. It's better than wearing SPF 30, being at the Dead Sea. Yeah. <laughs> I, I literally floated in this much water without touching the bottom, because I measured it. And of course I was not quite as, I was a little more buoyant those days. <laughs> All righty. Now another map, and like I said, I like this one, and you can see some of the mountainous terrain here. We got a, one a little bit further along that's gonna be better for that. This is another one I like a lot, except for the Palestine thing. And this actually mentions the judges and the kings, but look at Manasseh's stretch out here. This is gonna be a little different than the others. And again, they're very friendly to Ephraim. Big chunk of Med, good sized chunk of Jordan. Another reason I like that. They're older, so I'm wondering if they are less accurate, but I don't want to believe that, so that should make it so. All righty. This one does even less of a good job of following some natural boundaries, including that split up the middle of the Golan Heights. All right, this one I like a lot also. It's a terrible copy and impossible to read, and once again has Palestine, but it shows you the mountain ranges rather nicely. And Here is the Sea of Galilee, and this is when you hear references to the Golan Heights is, is over here, and it is a higher elevation, and there's volcanoes there, and it is a very rough area, and it was a terrible place to have your enemy because they would sit up top a good six, seven, eight hundred feet above you and just take sniper practice down into the villages along the Sea of Galilee. So when you hear people say, well, we need to give them back to Golan Heights, not until there's no more shooting, so that means when Jesus returns. But then it'll all be Israel, so, and that will be okay. 
All righty. And like I said that one shows the Golan Heights pretty well, and that will be more important next week. And I'm not going to do a bunch of maps on you next week. All right. Here's a better name for you, Tom. This is a fairly simple map, and this one has Ephraim reaching the Jordan, but not making it to the Mediterranean. All this to say there's still significant difference in, in reading those words we just read and interpreting them. But I do want to thank, and like I said, my, my favorite would be we come down here to around Joppa and hit, but probably don't have the big stretch of the Mediterranean. Yes, sir. Yep, that is low. <laughs> Death Valley doesn't even come close. That's the lowest in the United States of that, I'm 98% certain. All righty. For our, uh, oh, that is the last one of the ancient ones here. And this is modern day Israel. The I'm going to flip over to the next one pretty quick, but you can see it's significantly different. And the Gaza Strip and the West Bank are under Israeli sovereignty, but they are what's called the occupied territories, and the quote-unquote Palestinians have control of that. I missed something I was going to show you on one of the earlier maps, but this one has it. And this is actually a picture of the previous one that I scribbled on. But if you look at the hash marked lines, that was pretty close to the original areas. Palestine, Philistia actually would have covered approximately that much. So it's a little bit bigger than the Gaza Strip, but there's no claim to the West Bank outside of the last two centuries. So the Palestine name was given that area, I believe by the British, because, largely due to anti-Semitism and you know, wanting to take a cheap shot. But that is not an ancient name except for the Philistines who we read about frequently, and it was in those days called Philistia, hence Philistines. All righty, we're going to reread verse 10, which had most of our meat, and then we're going to meet. Verse 10, and they did not drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer, but the... Bach, that's fine. I'm kind of partial to the fugue in D minor, I think. But the Canaanites dwell among the Ephraimites to this day and have become forced laborers. You know, having some free labor doesn't sound that bad. But how does that work within the context of Judaism? What did they do with slaves? How did they become slaves? Yeah, they, and the, the doulos in the Greek that we usually translate as servant is really more of a slave. And sometimes we try to make it a loving slave and that's what we want to be. But that's a rosy picture of what wasn't a very pretty thing. They had commands from God to drive all the people out, often to kill them all, which we see is pretty brutal. But uh, anybody else geeky enough to have played Dungeons and Dragons when they were younger and willing to admit it? Two of us, okay. I had a friend that I was having a Bible discussion with 
that I used to play D&D with, and he was talking about how awful God was to go into these areas and wipe everybody out. And I compared it to, well, if you're lawful good and you go to, into an area that is run by chaotic evil, what do you do? So you kill them all. I mean, he loved to say kill them all. <laughs> so that actually made a point with a very intelligent fellow that I don't get to make too many points with. But God had a purpose for them driving these folks out. And we're paying the consequences to this day for that not happening. And that leads me to one of only two life lessons. We want to choose obedience every time. We want to do what God tells us to do. We don't always know why or know the consequences, but we can see in the Bible, we see from these verses that when we don't do as God commands, we never know the consequences of that sin and it can have impact on not just us, but future generations. And that happens both corporately and individually. I guess I explained it before I read it. Now let me read it. <laughs> disobedience versus disobedience, or disobedience versus obedience is still my theme, though I didn't show it much this time. Choose obedience every time. We never know the consequences of our sin through future generations both corporately and individually. And that was the spiritual lesson for tonight. And this is the only mention in here outside of geography. So I chose to go after geography in a big way this week. I won't bore you with that next week, but we might have one map, we won't have eight. But the other thing, and what we're going to talk about, and fortunately we got a good smattering of them, and this, I'd put it as a life lesson just so I could have two, because having one makes it sound like I didn't teach anything, like I didn't. But if you can, visit Israel. If you can't, study maps, pictures, and do all you can to get a better grasp of the context of the scriptures.